Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming in. Um, we're just going to wait a little bit to um, make sure everyone's able to log in uh, and, and join us here. Um, in the meantime, uh, I would just ask uh, for those um, currently on, if you could just type in the chat uh, where you're coming in from, where you're streaming in from. Um, we just want to... Um, you know, just uh, be be aware of what uh, what our audience is like here in, on this wonderful evening. Um, just some housekeeping as we're waiting. Um, uh, first off, uh, the chat box uh, will not be seen by everyone. Um, that'll be uh, just for the, the panelists because we'll be curating questions until the end, where there's a 15 minute Q and A session. Um, beyond that, uh, the presentation is being recorded and uh, all participants will be muted for the duration of the webinar. Um, so if you have a question, um, please don't hesitate to put it in the chat box um, and myself and others will, um, will collect them and, and uh, read them off um, at the end. Um, I just wanted to introduce myself first. Uh, my name is Brad Kasberg. I'm the Wetland Restoration Manager for Audubon Great Lakes uh, and the Project Manager for, uh, for, this, for this project. Um, with that in mind, I think uh, we have enough folks on board here that we could head off to the next slide um, to highlight some of this work. Um, thank you all. Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, Again, uh, it's, it's 6 o'clock, 6 p.m. Central Time. I really appreciate you all taking the time here to join us on this really exciting project focus on reconnecting Powderhorn Lake to Wolf Lake, which has uh, not, not been the case for uh, almost 100 years. Uh, so it's, it's a really major project. I'm, I'm really excited to have everyone join us today in talking about it. Uh, I wanted to introduce some of the other panelists um, and our partners on the project. Um, Joining us from the Great Lakes Commission, our funder uh, uh, is Jill Estrada. And then from the Forest Preserves of Cook County, we have Chip O'Leary and Steve Sillick joining us. Uh, but we have other partners as well. Those include NOAA, um, the federal agency, uh, as well as the Illinois DNR and Indiana DNR, um, as they are um, involved in the Wolf Lake side of things, as, as many of you uh, are aware. Um, and just a reminder that at the end, there will be a 15-minute Q&A session. Um, so before we jump into the details of the, the grant and what we're working on, I wanted to give our funder, Jill, uh, uh, from the Great Lakes Commission, a chance to talk about uh, their, their funding uh, mechanism. Um, it's the first time that a, um, a project that they funded has is, is been in Chicago. Um, so we're really proud to have brought that opportunity here. Uh, so please, uh, I'll, I'll hand it off to Jill, who can um, sum up uh, sum up the uh, funding mechanism and describe what uh, what brought uh, their interest to the southeast side of Chicago. Well, thank you, Brad, and thank you to everyone for your interest in this project and joining us tonight. Uh, as Brad said, this is a really exciting project, so we're very happy to be here um, sharing it with you. As Brad mentioned, I'm Jill Estrada. I am the Habitat Restoration Program Specialist at the Great Lakes Commission. And tonight I will be filling in for Eric Ellis, who is the Habitat Restoration Project Manager uh, for GLC, um, who also leads our project management team. So before we get into the details of the project, um, as Brad said, I'll give a brief overview of the funding source. Um, the, the Powderhorn Lake Restoration Project is one of several projects being funded by the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative through a 2019 regional partnership between the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and the Great Lakes Commission. So these regional partnerships fund projects such as feasibility, design, construction, and monitoring of prior restoration projects of Great Lakes Basin, um, mostly with a focus on protecting and restoring native fish habitat. So in this partnership, NOAA plays a role of the direct funder and the reporting agency uh, to other federal, federal agencies such as EPA. 
um, as well as providing vital technical monitoring to the project. And GLC is the regional partnership recipient, which means that we submit the actual application for the project funding. Uh, we manage multiple sub-recipients, including Audubon Great Lakes. So as I said, this is one of several projects within this regional partnership. Uh, we process invoicing from the local partners. So we help make sure the on the ground contractors get paid. We coordinate regional communication, which comes in the form of monthly meetings for our project management team, um, mostly to discuss the status and needs of that project and what the next steps are. Uh, we also help out with public outreach and information sharing. So at the end of this project, um, after the post, post restoration monitoring is conducted, we will share the results of that monitoring um, publicly on the Great Lakes Commission's website. And lastly, we provide restoration expertise to that project management team. So the project management team is really important um, to this, this project, which you'll hear about um, with, with each of the organizations that Brad already talked about. Uh, next slide, please. So the Powderhorn project was selected for the regional partnership for a number of reasons. Uh, not only was this project at the top of the priority list for the state of Illinois, but it was uh, previously funded by NOAA for engineering and design up to the 90% design stage. Um, so this current project is building off of that previous investment to see the project through to completion. Uh, additionally, the met metrics for this site, which I believe Chip will be speaking about a little bit later, um, those were very appealing to the overall goals of the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. Um, the project is one of the first of its kind in the Chicago area and has a lot of potential for improving fish and wildlife habitats. And lastly, one of the reasons it was chosen for this particular funding opportunity is that it brings together a number of stakeholders, many of whom you'll hear from tonight, who have shown a lot of dedication and expertise. And that's always very appealing to NOAA and the EPA when selecting projects for this funding opportunity. Um, so with that very brief overview, I will hand it back to Brad to give a history of the project site. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, can you um, go to the next slide, please? Uh, so just to give everyone background, I saw in the chat that there's quite a few folks from uh, from Hegewish and right outside uh, um, uh, the, it, within the Calumet region. So it might be familiar to most, but I just wanted to show the, the scope of the project here. So Powderhorn is the forest preserve site on the, um, it's the entire green area of, including Burnham Woods and um, um, the, um, the Forest Preserve area. Uh, our main uh, connection point is actually just north of it to 134th Street Marsh, um, which has recently come under ownership of the Forest Preserves, uh, with the connection extending further north to um, some, a, a strip of vacant land that the Forest Preserves um, bought even more recently than 134th Street Marsh and then uh, connecting on to Wolf Lake, um, just north of it. The red area I want to highlight is Powderhorn Marsh. Um, just to separate that from Powderhorn Lake, it's um, the area where there's um, likely to be the most significant opportunities for restoration for marsh birds and for fish um, because it is a very shallow body of water um, uh, that historically was much um, even shallower than it currently is. Um, and uh, with that, I will dive into some pictures of the history. If you can go to the next slide. Uh, so prior to 1929, uh, this land was um, uh, indigenous land. Uh, my tribe, the Miami tribe of Oklahoma, uh, this is um, the south side of Chicago is the uh, extent of our homelands, but it also includes uh, Council of the Three Fires, uh, Potawatomi, um, Ojibwe, Huron, um, and, and many others, Ho-Chunk, uh, Sock and Fox. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a long list. Um, but going into uh, 
Euro-American settlement of the region, uh, what was once unbroken and uh, really uh, diverse wetlands uh, throughout the entire Calumet region, um, it started to be um, drained, cut up, and, and segmented um, for um, residential and industrial purposes. If you'll see the, um, uh, you'll see on the, the red polygons that pop up um, that marsh uh, that I outlined, the focal point of our site, that is um, um, in 1929, it was marsh, um, and it has continued to be marsh. But what you'll see is that um, going into 1939 on the next slide, um, just the extent of um, increased development around these areas. So by this time, what was once a free-flowing system where fish could periodically migrate up and down and spawn in Powderhorn Marsh and then move to wetter uh, systems um, like Wolf Lake or um, what is now Calumet Lake um, or even Lake Michigan, um, now there was some segmentation. Uh, ultimately, um, the, the site that's known as Powderhorn Lake, just south of Powderhorn Marsh, that is actually man-made. That, um, um, that was dug out um, likely for excavation purposes. Um, so it wasn't until later that that system was actually um, included and, and has become the respite for sports fishing um, um, throughout, um, throughout Cook County. Um, next slide, please. I found this really neat photo this weekend highlighting the value of um, this region. This is uh, a Hegewish neighborhood um, uh, uh, rail line sometime in the first half of the 1900s. And it's just uh, so neat to see, um, again, we're building railway across what even in this photo looks like extremely healthy marsh habitat. Um, and it wasn't until about the 60s or so that that segmentation, that cutting off of Powderhorn from Wolf Lake um, caused us to see that um, degradation in, in marsh quality. Uh, talking with Walter Marsis, who's a you know, a community, a community member and birder extraordinaire. I can't, um, I can't thank him enough for just his vast knowledge of the history here. He was telling me that in the 60s and 70s, there were marsh birds that were present in such high numbers um, that, and, and now they're not seen, um, they, they don't nest in Powderhorn. Um, they don't even nest anywhere in Illinois and sometimes even within the whole Calumet region. So it's just, it's fascinating to see that that slow decline happen from about the 70s on. Um, um, next slide, please. Uh, marsh birds were so prevalent that Walter literally stumbled upon a nest of least bitter eggs um, uh, as early as 1991. And it's um, difficult to see that even now. And I, looking at the data, I don't think there's nesting least bitterns at Powderhorn, though they are found elsewhere. So we're excited to bring these back. And of course, um, ospreys aren't marsh birds, but anyone that's been to Powderhorn recently has heard, uh, has heard the osprey. Um, they are very vocal and they let you know when they have young and they don't want you um, um, near their nesting platform. Um, so um, it's just exciting work. Uh, next slide, please. So looking at the slide, um, you'll see uh, the red bars pop up. Um, they are the main points of uh, um, conflict in terms of getting water to, to um, flow through. Um, if you can advance to the next animation. Um, so the bars here are um, the railway and the road, which are the main limiting factors here that are reducing water um, flowing north um, through the system. This really impacts the shallow pool, as I mentioned, but also limits uh, water quality uh, or the, the dropping of water in even the dune and swale habitat. That's one of the best examples of dune swale habitat in all of Illinois. Um, so it's, it's sort of a, a major limiting factor for, um, for future restoration. If you can go to the next slide, I wanted to show uh, just how high water levels are. If you're, in the, if you're in the neighborhood, you know this railway. Um, this is the north end of Powderhorn Marsh. Um, Powderhorn Marsh is on the right-hand side. Um, this high water isn't good for anyone. It's not good for plants. It's not good for 
uh, marsh birds and it's not good for the, the railway. Um, it's not good for uh, the community right next door that um, has water spilling over periodically. So we're really excited at the opportunity to um, um, roll up our sleeves and, and really address um, the myriad of issues that, um, um, that this disconnection is, is causing. With that, I will leave it to Chip, who is um, from the Forest Preserves, and he um, can talk about. Um, oh, sorry. Let me let me first jump to Hemi Marsh. Hemi Marsh is what we aim to restore. As I said, this um, this is really the main opportunity at Powderhorn Marsh. Um, Hemi Marsh is basically a 50-50 mix of open water and emergent vegetation. Um, and there's been such consistently high water levels at Powderhorn Marsh that it's limiting the opportunity for vegetation to grow. So once we're able to lower those water levels again, we can provide that, um, that healthy change to the system. Um, that healthy change uh, is periodic. So we'll want to lower the water levels for a period and then ultimately raise them again and then lower them again down the road. It's a balancing act. We don't want too much vegetation. And we don't want um, too little vegetation. So we work with uh, the forest preserves to identify the best strategy moving forward um, once, once we get that constructed. Um, so once I have all, all of that laid out, um, we can move on to Chip, who will talk about some of the more nitty gritty engineering um, elements and, and project outcomes. Thank you. Thanks, Brad. Can you hear me, everybody? Can you hear me, Brad? Um, good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on this tonight. Um, as we think about Powderhorn from the perspective of the forest preserves, we recognize that this site has a lot of value for us um, on a number of fronts. As Brad mentioned, it has a lot of wildlife value. It has a lot of conservation value but it also has a lot of value for our citizens and our users. There's a fishery there for folks to come in and, and recreationally fish. There's also uh, some hiking opportunities for passive recreation as well as some picnicking opportunities. So it's an important site for us on multiple levels. Um, as Brad mentioned, the Powderhorn Lake and the associated Powderhorn Marsh has been, um, has been at an elevated water level for an extended period, certainly at least a couple decades um, without relief. And the, uh, what's, what's going on in this lake is that the Powderhorn Marsh that's bound by Brainerd and uh, the railroad and, um, and sorry, by the uh, road on the east side, every bit of rain that hits that site falls onto the property goes into the lake. So the property itself has become its own watershed. Everything that falls into there on the water side goes into the lake and uh, marsh and the water levels have been just sort of stacking up onto each other year after year. And some of the downsides that, that Brad had described, but I'll try to describe a little further are that the marsh itself, if you look at the photograph here, it looks like open water, which it is totally open water. There's no opportunity in there for vegetation to grow, which means there's no opportunity for um, uh, fish habitat for younger fish. They need that area for refuge, for hiding from predators. There's no opportunity for uh, aquatic insects to emerge, which provides the food for marsh birds. Um, in the lake itself, the lake itself at one point used to have some margins that provided habitat. They were um, opportunities within the lake itself for fish to uh, breed. And now the margins are simply just water right to the very edge. Um, the mar the, as Brad mentioned to the, on, your, on the slide, you're looking at to the left or really to the west is Powderhorn uh, Prairie and Marsh. And that's a nature preserve. It's super high quality. It's the highest highest biodiversity spot in the city of Chicago. Um, and so that is also the lake levels come up, that water spills into the wetlands within that marsh and those are degrading as well. Um, it, so it has this sort of high level of impacts, of course, to the north, it's also impacting the railroad itself, right? The, the uh, water is going right up and over the tracks. And then of course, once it gets past there, it's going into the neighborhood to the north and west. So there's, there's this, 
sort of long list of impacts going on due to this disconnection between Wolf Lake and Powderhorn Lake. Um, in uh, kind of looking at that problem and thinking about that problem, Hay and Associates, an engineering firm, had taken a hard look at this site and found some good news and bad news. The, the good news they found was that the water that goes into Powderhorn Marsh and Powderhorn Lake is, is quite clean. It's very nice quality water. Um, the, the bad news is that it has nowhere to go. So it's, it's stacking up, as I mentioned earlier. And so they were looking at how can we find some ways to get relief for this problem. And they put together a design um, for connecting Powderhorn Marsh with Wolf Lake and looking for an opportunity to return water levels to, if not historic levels, certainly a, a more productive level for, for both preserves. Um, this grant that we're here talking about today is taking that design from 2018 and really finishing that design in a way that looks at the details. How is this design going to impact wildlife? How is it going to impact our neighborhood? How is it going to impact our fisheries? And also providing the funding for the building of this, which is the, obviously the most important part. Um, so next slide, please. Okay, so, yep, no, that's okay. Yeah, that's great. All right, so this is a schematic, a drawing of how water now leaves Powderhorn Lake. There's a, a very small waterway that exits in the northeast part of the lake. Um, it's really there to give relief to one corner of the railroad itself. And so on the left of the slide, the, the sort of tall blue stack you see there is the water in Powderhorn Marsh, the sort of stippled pile with the NS over the top is the railroad berm, and that's made of uh, railroad ballast, so it's rock. And then on the other side of it, there's a, a blue strip, which is water, which is a, a ditch. And so what happens is Powderhorn reaches a certain level and it seeps through the rock on the railroad, so it doesn't have a direct access. It kind of seeps through at its own rate, and it hits the ditch, and then it hits this culvert, which is under the words access road. That's what that long rectangle is a culvert that when the water reaches the level of that, it carries that water uh, further north towards Wolf Lake, hits another wet ditch, goes through another culvert, and then goes into Wolf Lake, which is what you're seeing at the far right. Um, the two most important things on this slide and the two critical parts of the design of this project are the stippled portion under the railroad and then the number on the far right, that 23.5 inch. So what we're looking to do with this design is to, the schematic wouldn't look tremendously different, but what would be different is that the water going through the ballast is not gonna be going through the rock at whatever pace gravity can force it through that rock. We're gonna put that water through a pipe. So it's gonna have a clear and clean flow through the tracks, which will facilitate quicker and more water going through that system. Um, and then the second point is on the far right where it says 23.5 inches. That's what's called the fall, which is the, the height distance between Powderhorn and Wolf Lake. So if you want water to flow, you have to be, it flows from high ground to low ground. If you're standing on a 10 foot hill, for example, and you have a bucket of water and you pour it out, it's going to rush down the side of the hill and settle, settle at the bottom. If you're standing on a one foot hill, which you probably wouldn't even notice you're on a hill and you dump the water, it's really gonna take its time kind of figuring out where it's gonna go and it'll eventually find its way to the bottom. And so the more fall you have, the more gravity you get to push that water and the better water is gonna flow. So the design that, that we're looking at in this project takes that 23.5 inches of fall and they located another area between Powderhorn and Wolf Lake that has an additional 18 inches of fall. So you're gonna end up with over 40 inches of fall. So about you're going from about two feet to about three and a half feet of fall. That means you're gonna get a lot better flow. You're gonna spend less time maintaining uh, the water flow structures and get a better and quicker way to reduce water levels. Next slide, please. Okay, so here's a, a, an aerial. So you imagine yourself looking down on, on um, Powderhorn Marsh on the lower part of the slide, 134th Street Marsh in the middle and Wolf Lake on the top of the slide. 
And that black line is generally with the arrows on it is showing you the path this is going to take. There'll be a pipe coming out of Powderhorn Marsh and it'll go underneath the railroad tracks out to the other side onto the forest preserve property on the north side. And that'll flow through the marsh and then down and across 134th Street onto Forest Preserve property um, where there will create an open system. So there'll be uh, the easiest way to describe it is a ditch, but it's really a swale. So it's a gentle water opening so water can flow through that and then north and into the this southern finger of Wolf Lake. Uh, next slide. Okay, so um, what are the benefits to being able to drop water and change water? Well, one benefit here is what Brad mentioned earlier, the changes to this marsh. So this marsh now looks like a pond and um, Steve, who's gonna to talk to you later, he and I went out and I think Brad as well out, a, out on a boat and you used to be able to have, you, you could boat on the lake, but you get to the marsh and you'd have to get out in waders. Now you could just ride right over and, and use that as a pond. But what you're seeing there is the purple will be areas that will not be open water at certain times a year through this drainage structure. So we'll be dropping the water level in there. That'll allow the plants to grow up from the soil, uh, create habitat. When the water fills back in, you'll end up with excellent fish habitat, excellent bird habitat, as well as some retaining some open water. Um, this will also provide some relief. So next time it rains, you won't have high water in the marsh that's pushing up on the railroad track. You'll actually have a lower water level to start with when it rains. So it's, it's a, an excellent potential environment. Next slide, please. Okay. So um, I gave you a very, you know, you, we, you looked at an aerial photograph with a lot of lines going through it showing the course of this, but of course each um, design feature has its own component to drawing. And this is one of those drawings. This, the very bottom of the slide is Powderhorn Marsh and the black line coming up is the pipe going out of the marsh into uh, 134th Street Marsh property. The sort of black cone in there is um, a potential design feature, which would be a fish ramp. And what that would be would be uh, a scattering of rocks that will intercept the water as it comes out of the pipe reduce the energy and keep it from scouring the uh, property on the other side. And then it will have a side channel where uh, uh, that is not in the direct line of water flow where fish can, um, of course, uh, move from that point, wait out the rushing water, and then when the water is gentler, make their way forward. So there'll be, um, it's a two component um, ramp. The first part is to reduce scouring and water flow rates. And then it has a side component to help fish passage. Um, and so as you think about this project, it has many of these small features that we're considering and looking for the best options as we complete the design over the next few months to provide the, you know, the best benefit for water level reduction, improvement to fish hatcheries, as well as fish passage between the two lakes. Um, and so when we're, when this thing's done and we're able to exercise it, what we're hoping to get out of this is improve fisheries, improve bird habitat, improve nature preserve, and increase capacity to hold rainwater so you get less of this flashiness of tipping through the railroad tracks and into the alleyways, that type of problem that we've been talking about. Um, there's a lot more detail to this, and I am going to uh, pitch some of these components over to Steve and Brad for more detail. First, we're going to start with Steve Sillick to talk about the impacts of this design to the fisheries in both lakes. Well, thanks, Chip, and uh, thanks for having me on today, everybody. Uh, excited to be here talking about this great project that we have uh, coming up here real soon. Hopefully construction will be beginning soon and uh, get this connection underway. Uh, the Wolf Lake Powderhorn system is, is a phenomenal system. It really is a gem as far as uh, recreational fishing and boating for not only the south side of Chicago, but the south side of uh, Cook County as well, and Northwest Indiana for that matter. Uh, the, the Forest Preserve District along with all the partners has worked a lot with the Illinois and Indiana Departments of Natural Resources as well because of the strong fish component of this. Combined, you're looking at 
well over a thousand acres of open fishable water when you combine the Wolf Lake system and the Powderhorn system that will now be connected um, in, in a much more manageable and efficient way to, to greatly enhance and assist the, um, the fisheries of, of the overall system. Uh, you know, Wolf Lake, very popular fishing lake, uh, state border lake. The Illinois site alone, you know, has over 40 species identified in it and pretty regularly gets stocked with a variety of uh, over seven game species that, that provide a really good angling opportunity for fishermen. Powderhorn anglers, on the other hand, very similar fishery, but uh, just much smaller scale. You're looking at, you know, 50, 50 acres of open water with another uh, 55 acres of that marsh area that, that provides really good habitat for the fish. So uh, enhancing these, improving these systems is gonna, is gonna be wonders for the, the overall system. Next slide, as you can see, really good fish in the area. Uh, the goals of this, you know, not, not, to, not to repeat what the, the, everyone before me said, but ultimately by, by connecting these systems, um, putting the connectivity of the, the larger, the larger, deeper Wolf Lake system with the smaller Powderhorn system, uh, you're just gonna open up the gene pool of, of the fish species that, that overlap as well as opening up the potential for uh, increase in some new fish species. It's gonna work one, it's gonna help immensely with just the overall fish composition and species composition of the systems. Uh, the, the, the even more exciting portion of that is basically restoring the, the marsh habitat, the, the Powderhorn Marsh and then the marshes in the north, as far as uh, re recovering the water levels that should be there that provide the great fish uh, reproductive systems that were there. Currently, as, as we've determined, they, they are basically open water systems where you can drive a boat through them. You're talking upwards of four feet deep. While that's good open water, it's, it's not the best uh, re reproductive habitat for a lot of these species. So by being able to recover these uh, lower shallow marsh and heavy marsh levels, you're providing a much healthier ecosystem with the native plants that should be there that are gonna promote a lot of growth with uh, zooplankton, the, the, the smaller insects and animals that the younger fish that the, the adult fish can breed with them and the younger fish can, can use for refuge, hide out, grow up in, uh, get food in, as well as just improving the overall water quality by acting as more of a filter instead of a deeper, you know, four foot stagnant water. So th these goals will really help improve not just the fishery, but also the, the, the plant life and the insect life of this marsh and Hemimash area, which the, the more biodiversity you have in a system like Powderhorn and Wolf Lake, the better they're gonna be. They have, they're, they're very healthy and good systems now, but this is only gonna make them that much better. Next slide, please. So just to give you some more, more specifics, uh, Wolf Lake between Illinois and Indiana, you're looking at over a thousand acres. Uh, most of my information is based on the Illinois side, but to, to record uh, dating back about 30, 40 years, they've collected over 40 species of, of fish. Powderhorn on the other hand, looking at, if you include the, the lake and the marsh, you're more like a uh, hundred acres. We've had just over about 30 species uh, based on Forest Preserve's historical records. Looking, looking at and comparing those, um, those species lists, you really have some good potential for, uh, for, for basically new species to, to introduce themselves into the Powderhorn system. And we're talking some really good both game and non-game species, uh, specifically fish like walleye, red or sunfish, rock bass, white crappie, and then some, some high quality non-game species, some of your more, your, your uh, river creek uh, non-game species like shiners and carp suckers. Uh, again, increasing the biodiversity is always good for, for systems like this. What's even more exciting is the, the potential for uh, the, the genetic, increasing the gene pool, basically making your, your fish populations more robust and healthy. So there's a lot of other, again, both game and non-game species that uh, exist in both lakes that Smaller powderhorn could, could, could uh, benefit from by having the, the introduction of some, some more of these uh, gene pools getting introduced into the system. Uh, as a lot of you may know, if you fish the area, that system has phenomenal uh, perch and pike. Uh, grass pickerel are a, a really fun fish people like catching. But then some of the non game fish again, things like lake chub suckers and brook silverside. Really, really cool aspect of this is some of the state threatened species in the area, specifically the Iowa darter and banded killifish. These are both really important keystone species that uh, exist in these systems that by, by connecting these systems, again, is gonna greatly, in help, greatly enhance the, the, the overall productivity and, and health of these systems. 
additional research is currently getting done on uh, specifically the band of killifish. So this is going to be a, another cool aspect by uh, connecting these two systems and, and, and monitoring the, uh, the potential increase in habitat and quality. Next slide. So uh, recently we were able to uh, partner up with the Illinois Natural History Survey, the, uh, the, the Kaskaskia Biological Station is assist, uh, assisting the forest preserve districts and the DNR and all the partners with, uh, with some extensive, not only research and development on making the fish passage uh, as efficient as it can be, but also with a lot of the, the monitoring. So they have a pretty extensive uh, pre-construction and post-construction monitoring program that is already uh, a good field season in, both on Powderhorn and Wolf Lake, Indiana. Uh, this is, it, it's a multi-tiered, multi-yeared uh, scope of work that, that, that we're really excited to have getting done. Uh, they're gonna be able to provide some really cool data that, that's gonna really help, uh, not only with the overall assessment of the systems right now, but also to, to see how they're really benefiting from this project. Uh, first objective is real basic, looking at the water quality. Some of your basic factors like dissolved oxygen, temperature, uh, phosphorus levels uh, for, for plant growth, chlorophyll A, which is an indicator of a uh, phytoplankton, which is the, the, the key base uh, food source for lighter foods, as well as some sonar data that they'll be collecting. So they're getting some real basic water chemistry uh, pretty much every month through the field season. A lot of this work is getting done on a monthly basis from May through September. So they're able to collect a lot of good data uh, this first field season alone, which they're currently processing. Uh, second objective is assessing the zooplankton communities. This is basically the, the food source for all the fish. Uh, sorry, uh, the food source for all the fish. So zooplankton is very popular. Though, though you don't always see them or they may look like the creepy crawlies, you really need that bottom of the food chain in order to have the, the healthy uh, larger fish. So it's definitely important to make sure you have good zooplankton communities because that's ultimately going to make for better game fish communities, which is kind of what we're shooting for here. Uh, if I could skip ahead to number four real quick, that's the quantifying the reproductive activity. There we're looking at the larval fish populations. Basically, how, how well are these fish reproducing? And again, this is getting done both before the, the connection is established while these marsh levels are high, and then we'll be getting done afterwards. So this is gonna be very helpful in seeing if we see some improved reproduction. Uh, the last two, number three and five, kind of go hand in hand. Number three is basically assessing the overall fish communities. This is very generically looking at the game and non-game species as far as uh, community strength, fish population, diversity, numbers and sizes. They're doing a series of uh, electro fishing runs, fike netting, seine netting, trap netting, things of that nature to, to basically collect and, and uh, look at the populations both pre and post construction on Powderhorn and Wolf Lakes. This is only gonna get done in the spring and in the fall. However, one of the uh, other really cool aspects of this kind of segues into the, the fifth objective, which is assess assessing functional connectivity of the systems. We can go to the next slide, please. During the fish collection, they will be uh, inserting pit tags or passive integrative transponders into certain species and sizes of fish. Uh, you look at that top left picture, if any of you are familiar with pit tags or avid chips, these are very similar to what they put in your pets to monitor them. They're about the size of a grain of rice and they can basically get injected just uh, below the skin. The bottom picture shows uh, an injection with a syringe where you can then, uh, when you recapture these fish during follow-up fish population surveys and inventories, the top right picture shows a uh, handheld transmitter or a receiver that can, uh, you, you can run that over and scan the barcode to see if you're getting fish movement back and forth. The second aspect of this, which is very cool, is uh, radio frequency uh, identification antenna can be installed at the pipes that are going to be connecting the system. So there will be four RFID or radio frequency ID antennas installed at all these connection points. So in future years, more specifically 2022 and beyond, we can actually monitor if the fish are going through these, how well how well they're using the new connection points and um. Uh, Passage back and forth of fish within the systems. So uh, this is all in this is all in addition to work that the Forest Preserve District and the DNR already have going on in the systems. So we're going to be collecting a lot of really cool fish data, as as we always should be, just to kind of see how the systems are doing and see what, what how, how beneficial this project's going to be. So really excited about the the fish side of things and can't wait to to get this connection going. 
So with that, I'm going to pass things back to Brad, who's going to talk some more about marsh birds and some of the other monitoring programs that are going to be. Thank you, Steve. Uh, I'm here to talk about the marsh bird impacts. Um, again, we're Audubon Great Lakes and we, we love our birds. Uh, I wanted to first talk about um, a similar project um, uh, at, a, at a Calumet wetland site. This is at Big Marsh um, Park District site. I'm sorry, Chip and Steve, it's not a forest reserve site, but uh, basically um, there were a lot of similar uh, restoration activities that, that took place there um, between 2015 and 2016, where they were able to um, manipulate the water levels uh, more precisely and uh, um, remove some of the invasives and all of that. And you can see uh, on this graph um, that in that pre-restoration phase, there were only um, two different species found at Big Marsh during our monitoring. But once we um, uh, uh, collectively restored the site, there was just an absolute explosion of species present um, up to 11 in 2018. So um, the opportunities are immense and um, we're seeing this replicated at wetlands across the Calumet. Um, so for the fact that we can reconnect Powderhorn to Wolf Lake uh, and, and, and provide this opportunity for um, habitat connection that again hasn't been there for decades um, is, is um, so significant to the to the health and quality of the Calumet as a whole, let alone Powderhorn and Wolf Lake. Uh, next slide, please. This is showing um, the Calumet sites uh, with Powderhorn um, uh, under that orange arrow, and basically it's kind of showing the density of marsh birds um, within the system. And even now, before this significant restoration, it's about mid-level, um, so uh, uh, the opportunity here um, to expand almost 55 acres of hemi marsh um, alone at Powderhorn, um, we're, we're really excited at, at what can happen. Um, so I'll show you how we're, um, how we're monitoring that on the next slide. We have marsh bird monitoring points, those are the yellow dots, and basically what we have been doing there the past few years is um, uh, well, Walter Martzis has been the one kind enough to do it. Um, wake up early in the morning and um, go out to each point and listen to uh, and observe uh, any marsh birds that, that are, in, are present. So we record what we find, where, um, and so we can track that over time. Um, with this project, we're also adding in vegetation and water level monitoring to that. So we'll be able to assess not just how marsh birds respond individually to um, the reconnection and restoration, uh, but also how the um, how we're doing in terms of vegetation restoration um, and uh, assessing the um, success and speed of water level drainage in the system, um, which is essential um, for lowering, but also in the future for management pur uh, purposes for the forest reserves for them to better assess. Um, the, uh, um, the ongoing water level needs. If there's a drought or a flood period, um, they can adapt man, um, um, uh, their management to that. Um, on the next slide, I will show um, another element of monitoring that we do. This is how we track water levels. Um, crowd hydrology is a community science initiative. We've plugged it in elsewhere uh, throughout the Calumet. I think there's about four or five sites now that use it where you can literally just go on, um, take your cell phone, read the number on the, on the gauge and text that in to the website. Um, there's no app, there's no, you know, you don't have to use data. You just literally text that number in the reading and it'll automatically up, update it. Um, and that's phenomenal because it's just so easy for us then to um, monitor those water levels and the community can get involved and help us keep track. So the more, the more data that we get from the public, the, the more accurate our readings become and the better we can, we can respond to changes in these water levels. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so we have a stewardship section. Uh, um, this was recorded by Alice Brandon, who is the um, um, head of stewardship for Powderhorn. So if we could, um, um, it's a pre-recorded message. So uh, thank you. Hi, my name is Alice Brandon, and I'm pleased to talk a little bit about 
some of the volunteer work that's been happening at Powderhorn Lake and Prairie since 2006. My information is below, so if you have any questions after hearing this information, I'd love to hear from you. So since 2006, I have been leading volunteer workdays at the site. What we mean by workdays is just coming out to volunteer for a few hours on a Saturday to help care for the site, to improve the habitat for plants and animals and people. This picture is a picture of some students from George Washington High School. I've been lucky to work with them in the past to help us with some of our volunteer efforts. This is a day when they came out in the fall to help with seed collecting. Powderhorn Prairie and Lake is so important because it has a lot of different habitats for plants and animals. So we've got prairie. You can see a picture of the prairie here with my friend Luis, who's helping me seed collect that day. We also have savannas and wetlands, of course. And because there's different types of habitat, it supports different species. That, um, and because of this, this site is considered one of the most biologically diverse sites in Cook County and is considered the most biologically diverse place in the city of Chicago. As volunteers, we've been working since 2006 to remove invasive shrubs and trees from the site. These species are not native to North America, and because they were brought from other places, they have no natural predators and are able to quickly take over. The problem with that is if they get in too high of numbers, they create a dense shade, which in turn makes the beautiful wildflowers and grasses disappear because they don't get enough sunlight. You can see in, one, in this one picture, a picture of all the amazing spring wildflowers that are at the site in May. And with too much shade, they cannot survive. If they can't survive, then the insects and the birds and other species also don't have the food sources they need. So that's one of the main things we've done. We've removed invasive species with college students, local high school students, and corporate work days in the past as well with companies. We've also, what we do then after we move the invasive species is we come in and we collect seed from the site of different grasses and flowers and we spread them in so that the site can be returned to health. This really shows what a difference it makes when we remove invasive shrubs and trees. On the left, you will see what happens when we do not. So you can see that there is just one species of shrub growing and underneath is bare ground. Then after we remove this, this, these, this brush, the prairie plants and flowers are able to return. This is the same location over a two year period. It makes a huge difference in terms of the enjoyment of the site and habitat for our wildlife and birds. Besides exploring the site on your, on your own or coming out to volunteer, we also host community events. Our biggest one is Teen Exploration Day. This is hosted by the Forest Preserves of Cook County. It's free and is a great way for teens to learn about the forest preserves, nature, and also have a really fun day out. So this is a handout from a few years back, but please let me know if you're interested and don't know about this. We wanna make sure that the local community and neighborhoods are taking advantage of this amazing experience. If you would like to get involved after learning a little bit about the site and what we do, please let me know. We could use your help doing seed collecting. You could talk to Audubon Great Lakes about monitoring for birds. We would like to keep tabs on what birds are there and how well they're doing at the site. That helps us to understand if the work we're doing is important and making a difference for local wildlife. Or just come out and enjoy the site. The site looks amazing at this point. You'll see any time of the year, It'll be different. Different flowers grow every month. We also have picnicking, fishing, and canoeing um, opportunities at the site. So I hope you've learned a little bit about what we've been doing, and I hope to hear from you. Thank you. Bye. So uh, as well as the stewardship activities uh, and volunteer opportunities, I just wanted to provide you all with some context of um, what you can expect to see here uh, in the next year. Um, construction is currently slated to begin um, about mid-late summer. Um, there will be stewardship and volunteer activities 
um, likely happening right around the, the same time. Um, and then, of course, if um, there's any interest in marsh bird and fish monitoring um, at um, Powderhorn or anywhere else in the Calumet, feel free to reach out and we'd, we'd love to hear from you. Um, with that, um, I'm going to open it up for questions. Uh, we've been getting some really great questions and, and feedback throughout. Um, so I will um, sort of read through these and um, tackle what um, um, and, and pitch it to our panelists here. So first off, um, there's a really great question about uh, that Joan asked regarding what is the pro uh, projected impact on Wolf Lake water levels? Um, Chip, I was wondering if you could tackle that question. Sure. Um, so we don't anticipate, and we talked with the uh, DNR about this at length, and we, we don't anticipate any major impacts to Wolf Lake. I think it's a little bit hard to tell from the aerial photographs, but you know, Powderhorn Lake is a 50 acre lake um, and the marsh is 50 acres. So together they're about a hundred acres. And um, of course, Wolf Lake is over a thousand acres. So um, it's a much bigger system. And uh, if you're thinking about the water, the contribution from Powderhorn at the levels that were the quantities of water that would move from Powderhorn to Wolf Lake, that would not be um, uh, a big lift for Wolf Lake. I don't think you'll see much of a tick in the notch in terms of uh, water levels at Wolf Lake. Um, but I think in terms of the potential um, transfer of aquatic species between the two, I think that's a great benefit for Wolf Lake. They have some neat populations of um, not only some neat fish, but also some neat amphibians and, and other things that um, would benefit from having a second habitat um, to the south. I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Chip. Uh, okay, I'm seeing another great question. Um, how would uh, how would a warmer, wetter future impact this ecosystem? Um, that's a great question, um, and that's why our water control structures include a lot of diversity in controlling the water, uh, because with climate change, a lot of these um, anticipated um, uh, precipitation cycles are likely to change, but there's no clear uh, certainty in one way or the other whether it's going to be um, low water or high water. So this allows us to adaptively respond to any of those uh, any of those issues around climate change. Um, let's see here. We have um, a question about 134th Street Marsh. Um, just asking, it's currently has some fairly low water levels. Um, so it's just some questions on um, its condition and if, um, if it's being drained in any way or if that's just a natural response. Um, and, and Chip, I'll, I'll leave that to you again. Sure, thanks, Brad. Um, yeah, 34th Street March, I, I don't know if folks have noticed, we, this year, um, this fall in particular is one of those falls where it, has hardly rained at all. We've had over two months of uh, maybe just a couple rain events, none of them particularly big. So it's a it's sort of the standard time of year in a non-climate change world where um, wetlands would naturally draw down. Um, we haven't done any draining of it as of yet, and we are looking at um, ways to um, ensure that the water levels in the marsh are not um, artificially reduced by this drainage system. So we'll be putting some type of structure in place to ensure that the water levels in the marsh remain um, at the levels that they have been in healthy times. But right now the drying that you're seeing is really due to just the lack of rain for an extended period of time. We're seeing that wetlands all over the county. Thank you. Uh, I'm seeing some questions on the rest of the timeline. I ran through 2021. Uh, construction is expected to be completed in the end of 2022. Um, so we'll have um, post monitoring in that, um, that fall as well. Uh, I have a question here um, about Phragmites. Um, what will we do to restore or, or keep Phragmites at bay um, 
when the marsh system's lowered. Uh, water level management is also a good way to keep Phragmites at bay. Um, Phragmites is a, um, it likes the stability that uh, the um, current system has that, uh, you know, there's, there's no high or low period. It's strictly um, fairly, fairly consistently high. Um, so, so the ability to change those water levels periodically will um, just naturally keep Phragmites um, at, a, at a disadvantage compared to um, uh, native plants. Um, I have a question here on, um, on uh, uh, let's see, wild rice. Is wild rice native to the area? And would this project be a good wild rice restoration uh, uh, opportunity? Um, unfortunately, wild rice is, um, th there may have been some historic populations, but um, not in numbers where it's significant enough to, um, to really thrive in, in current conditions. Um, we have another question. This is um, for Steve. I see that fish will be injected with the pit tags. Uh, and I'm curious why the technology isn't used in birds. What is the difference? Um, as I read that, I realized, uh, yeah, do you, want, do you want to tackle that, Steve, or should I? It's probably better for you, I think, the the because they're looking more at the birding side, so that would be more you, I guess. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I think pit tags uh, have a smaller radius of where they, of detection, it has to be pretty close. Um, so there's other radio transmitters and bands that, that um, mark birds that, that can be used, that can be detected at much um, further distances. Um, let's see. Um, what species is the bird? That, a lot of people are asking about that on here. This is the osprey. This is a resident of Powderhorn. Um, I have some questions on the connection from Wolf Lake to uh, to Lake Michigan and, and how uh, Indian Channel plays into this system. Um, Chip, I, I think you might be well suited to address that um, that that stretch of the the system. Yeah, sure. So that that you hit the nail on the head there. That is the connection between Wolf Lake and um, Lake Michigan. So there's a there is a direct waterway connection through that system. Um, so you can get fish moving from the lake down the river and then up the creek and into Wolf Lake. So there is a connection in that direction. Um, and so it is an important waterway for the Wolf Lake system. And despite the fact that Wolf Lake has been uh, drastically altered over the years, tremendous changes. You know, if, if you look at the series of aerial photographs through time, it grows, it shrinks, it, uh, it's full of water, it's empty, you know, uh, people did a lot of messing with it, but that portion of the system really does still work very well. Thank you. Um, Mario asked, what is the hydrologic relationship to Eggers Marsh? Um, Chip, you wanna take that one away too? <laughs> Keep through the, the drainage of uh, Southeast Chicago? Yeah, sure. So Eggers Marsh um, was originally really just um, attached to the north end of Wolf Lake. Um, it, in the 50s in the Cold War, they built a, a military facility there. And so as part of that, they took some of the low ground and, um, apologies, I didn't turn my camera on. Um, they took part of the low ground and filled it with um, slag from the iron, uh, from the steel mills and raised that up. And so that created a barrier between the two. However, if you go to the very Southeast part of Eggers Marsh, there is a little bit of a little sort of cut around that goes and there's a little bit of a, a marsh on the very East end that is connected between the two. Um, and our, our, drainage structure right now, and this was put in place in the, I believe, you know, not too long after the military facility was put in, actually drains Eggers Marsh to the north. So it's, it's a little bit the reverse of what it once was. Thank you. Uh, will the swale connecting the two lakes be made into a park area? 
Um, that's a great question. Uh, part of what we really want to do here is, uh, um, with that connection, um, uh, eventually open that up to be, um, to be a, a, a park with stewardship activities. If you're ever around 134th Street Marsh, um, you'll see that um, the residents have, you know, um, they, they keep that area clear um, because it is such a beautiful view. Um, so it is um, already a community asset. So um, nothing's set in stone. And, and part of our goal here is to um, draft some of that community visioning on what, uh, um, what future um, uh, recreation or um, visitation um, could look like. In that in that stretch between Wolf Lake and Powderhorn Lake, um, design of everything has um, ease of management and um, aesthetics in mind, um, and, and safety in, in mind as well. So um, um, any swale or anything like that will um, will certainly be designed in a way that is um, appealing and beneficial to the community. Brad, I did want to add to that that we we have been working on some trail design between um, the, the south end of Wolf Lake there where this project starts and 134th Street Marsh. It, it's still forming up, but it, it will happen. Uh, there's another question here about um, the, the dune and swale, the, the extremely high quality um, um, area of Powderhorn. Um, asking about anticipated changes due to um, the lowering of the uh, uh, water levels. Um, it's a high quality site. Is there any risk of, um, of that changing plant composition significantly? Uh, the, the good news is, is that um, the land stewards there, Dan Spencer, um, uh, is really looking forward to dropping water levels a bit in that system, at least for a little while. Uh, um, it's been a little too consistently wet. So we, we expect actually diversity and, and health of the system to improve and expand. Um, right now, uh, there's a, um, a wetland shrub called buttonbush. Uh, and that is, um, it's a great native plant, but it can be a little aggressive in wetter areas. So by um, reducing water levels and cutting that out or cutting it back a little bit, we can um, to maintain a bit of the, the high quality nature of that site. Um, let's see, um, where do you find the history of locations and the history of, of Powderhorn? Uh, that's a fun question. I think we can all take that. Um, Steve, you know a lot about the history of sort of the, the fish and, and fish migration. Do you want to tackle um, kind of how we as um, conservation partners or just citizens uh, have learned more about, about that history? Uh, a, a lot of the stuff on the, the powder horn system and the, and the forest reserve properties are basically just from historical records. Uh, some of those, a lot of those actually are archived um, and are publicly accessible or basically by reaching out to the, the forest preserve staff, a lot of the information can be obtained. Um, the powder horn lake was built in 1958. While there wasn't a fisheries section within the forest preserve district the state was managing it and we do have records on all that so uh you know i, I can't really speak on behalf of the the state's property but as far as the forest preserve property uh, there are really good records on the lakes the marshes and uh, all, all the holdings that the forest preserve district have which are available through archives as well as uh simply by reaching out to any of the staff so Thank you, Steve. And, and just to echo that, um, there's a lot of just good historical resources, um, even um, just uh, to get you started, the public library has historical maps. Um, the southeast side of Chicago is so fascinating. It's natural and um, economic history is just um, really neat. So um, there's tons of local resources to let you dive in there as well. Um, we have time for a couple more questions if anyone wants to um, jump in and, and ask any more. Um, I'm scrolling through here. Uh, will this presentation be available for those that were unable to attend? Uh, yes, we will, we will provide that um, to be available. Um, 
We have another question. Steve, I think this is a question for you, um, though not a fish. Uh, will turtles be able to move through the fish ramp? Yeah, turtles are being brought into consideration with all the uh, the ramps, the water control structures, the pipes, and, and things of that nature. Uh, there is a really good turtle population in the Powderhorn system, especially in the marsh areas. So I believe there are uh, a lot of lot of options and design plans for accommodating turtles as it pertains to things like the, the railroad tracks, any of the um, water control structures and things of that nature. So turtles definitely are being uh, brought into the conversation as far as the, the wildlife um, enhancement improvements to the project. And I'll, I'll keep you on, Steve. Um, we have a question from Joe about um, insects. What are the anticipated impact on insects uh, um, through this project? Uh, if anything, I think it would improve it by, by bringing back a lot of the native vegetation types and making a healthier overall ecosystem that's only going to benefit the, the insect populations that currently are probably pretty, you know, um, stifled by the, the monocultures that exist in these unhealthy systems, be it no vegetation in open water or stands of Phragmites and uh, things of that nature. So by increasing the, the habitat or by improving the habitat, you're going to ultimately improve the vegetation. And that's kind of the root of, of, of the insect population is the native vegetations. So, um, I mean, obviously during construction phases, there's going to be some so some hampering, but the ultimate goal is going to be incredible benefits for the insect populations of the area. Thank you. Uh, I have a question here on what kind of birds do we expect to come back? Uh, so pie-billed pie grebes are one of the species that um, are already present, though in, in pretty low numbers. Um, they're a marsh bird that um, uh, fortunately, again, this is fish passage and, and improving fish spawning. Uh, they love to eat fish, so um, it's a it's a bird eat fish world out there. And I think uh, I think pied billed grebes are, are really gonna um, make a nice comeback. And um, they're an adorable bird. They're the ones that we have on the, the cover and, and end of the slide. You'll see it after the slide. Um, we expect them to come back. Um, least bitterns are the smallest heron. Um, they're like they're like about this big, very small heron. Um, they were present before, as Walter indicated, and are around the Calumet, and we expect them to um, similarly respond pretty quickly. Um, I have a question here about construction. Will the construction be visible to the community? Uh, uh, Chip, do you want to take that away? Do you repeat the question, Brett? Uh, will cons the construction of this um, actually be visible to the community? Yes, I think you'll see the work, um, you know, particularly in the locations where it crosses the road. So at 134th and 131st Street, that'll be the most obvious portions. Um, I think beyond that, you know, certainly the um, the initial stages will be out of sight unless you're um, in one of the homes right there at the very northwest corner of the marsh um, across from the railroad tracks. Thank you. Um, Steve, uh, uh, any way to restore sturgeon habitat through Indian Creek and the rest of the Calumet area? Uh, that, that's one I'm not sure about. I, I can I can ask around. I, I'm not familiar with the historic sturgeon populations in Indian Creek, but I don't really see it having much of an effect. Uh, honestly, I don't see it affect affecting it or improving it in any way. But that's that's something I can uh, look into it more at the state level that manages the the larger bodies where the sturgeon have been found. But um, I don't anticipate it benefiting sturgeon no. Thank you. Uh, I have a question about what's the best way to sign up and get involved with Audubon, whether that's stewardship or um, or monitoring. Um, you can visit our website, gl.audubon.org, or visit our Facebook page and follow us. Um, you'll be able to message us and um, get our contact information that way. Um, 
And uh, uh, the same goes for the Forest Preserves. Just check out um, the Forest Preserve website. Um, we'll send an email after this as well, outlining um, contact information for some of the panelists, including myself, so that uh, we can really um, uh, grow from this webinar and, and, and facilitate as much stewardship and um, of engagement uh, activities as, as you all are interested in. Um, so um, with that wrapping up, um, we're, we're a little over. Um, I appreciate all your questions. Um, thank you so much for coming out here today and, and spending time with us to learn about this, again, um, reconnection project that has been decades in the making. Um, we really appreciate all of this. We'll have, um, we'll have this on Facebook still, so you'll be able to um, review um, or, or share this recording out with anyone. So thank you. Thank you all.